Good morning, everyone. Uh, sabi ni Melissa, keep it light daw, so we'll try to keep it light. Pero we have a script, we have to stick to the script, so we uh, stick to the time. Good morning. First, we would like to thank our class for entrusting this talk to us. We hope those who are here would not regret their decision to be here. Baka mamaya sabihin niya, sana nag-aaral na lang ako. Uh, we can assume that the people here are from three groups. First one, those interested to get hitched to another doctor like themselves. The second one is those currently in a relationship with another doctor and wondering if it's worth it to stick it up with the one you're with. And third one, ngayon ko lang na-realize, are the charity workers, yung mga nagkakawang gawa, yung mga kaklase namin sa kapag-anak namin who are here to give us all our support. And most of you acting like the true doctors you are, you wanted to do research first by listening to us before you take the plunge. Sabi nga, ang mga doktor, kahit sa pag-ibig, scientific pa rin. Okay? So, talagang the best. So, for the few who are here, let's give ourselves a Okay. Does anyone here know Leros? Anyone here? Lea Rose? No one has ever heard of Lea Rose Gargoyenia? This is the picture of our dear friend, Lea Gargs. My groupmate, same beginning letter of my surname. Her married name now is Lea Rose Gargoyenia Bakutan. She's a pediatrician in San Antonio, Texas. She was Grace's Gargada, friend and org mate, in New Pilos Banos, where they took their pre-med in biology. But most importantly, she was Grace's roommate in med school. Her sorority says, and the reason why I got the chance to know Grace. Alea, if you're there, I haven't thanked you enough. Maraming salamat. Ikaw ang may kagagawa ng lahat ng ito. In first year med, during breaks and review times for exams, I would seek out Alea for company. As a corollary to that, I became friends with her anatomy groupmate, which included, uh, of course, him. We became good friends among the cadavers. I had already seen Grace. Uh, I had already seen Grace. <laughs> when we, as I look at it right now, by faith, took the Enma together in La Salta. Even then, sa Tagalog, noon pa man. I thought she looked really nice. It was great that she voluntarily came to sit with our group, more or less regularly, in the first three years of med school. That was before our clinical rotations. She was with Lea a lot during the common class lectures, and the proximity made it easy for me to talk to her. Just friendly stuff though, because she had a long-standing relationship with a boyfriend then. When my relationship ended early to the third year of med school, I had the shock of my life when Dennis asked me to go to the Five Ball as his date. Oh, bring me a Okay, <laughs> A few more months of readjusting into our new roles as a possible couple. Well, then we made it official. And we've been together ever since. Three years before marriage and another 25 years as a married couple, we've been together for 28 years longer than we've been with our parents or anyone else. We decided to get married right after we passed the medical board exams. Since we wanted to train together as medical residents abroad where my family resided. Well, that was the initial plan anyway. We graduated May 1991, took the board's August, passed it early December, and got married before the year ended December 30, 1991. It's funny that you learn a lot of things in med school, but after that, know very little on how to go about practicing it. If you were taught strategies on how to set up a medical practice, it must have been taught on the days I was absent to cram for an exam, or when I was present pretending to listen to a lecture, but really overtly, overtly studying my notes as I know some of you are doing right now. 
I was the first doctor in my nuclear family, as Dennis was in his. Though my uncle was a doctor, it didn't cross our mind to ask him about tips on starting a practice. We just barged right on with our plans, winging it just like we did in the wards and in exams. We wanted to train abroad, as fate, as fate would have it, we got turned down for a U.S. visa twice. While awaiting another chance to try for a U.S. visa, Grace became a company physician for their family's two ceramic companies and drew salary from that. Her mom set up a small clinic for her. <laughs> it was very small, we didn't bother to take a picture of the clinic. <laughs> the signage is better than the clinic itself. Where she saw a few patients each day, emphasis on the word few patients each day. I became a resident physician, which is really just a glorified term for an intern that has passed the medical boards. You saw patients in the ER, gave the initial remedies, called up the attending consultants, and carried out their orders. You took care of the patient's needs and nurses couldn't handle them. Though our salaries allowed us to live, it didn't give us much space for anything else. We gave up our US plans and decided to train for a specialty here. Dennis got accepted in UPPGH Pediatrics after our graduation. The schedule was rough and we hardly saw each other. By this time, we already had a son who was growing up as a stranger to him. A year later, I followed him at PGH as a dermatology resident. My mom substituted for us as a parent on the days we were not around. Our child rearing was anything but conventional. We woke up our son every time we had a chance to come home, never mind if it was one or two in the morning. My mom thought we were crazy. We would turn on all the lights and play games with him, pretending it was daytime. We slept on the bus to and from PGH and met at the PGH mess hall for our meals to save on money eating mystery meat. <laughs> Buti na lang, we were young and used to the hard times. You do not survive in the toughest hospital in this country after all, if you weren't made of the sterner stuff. We even sold ceramic items in the PGH Christmas Changes during the weekends, as the derm training program was mainly on weekdays. Some of the doctors I sold to would sometimes do a double take and say, Wait, you have a doctor as a PGH? I took an extra year in pediatrics as chief resident, so Grace and I graduated the same year. I wanted to do private practice first so I could help her pay for the schooling of her eldest. Grace insisted though that I go straight to subspecialty training in pulmonology as I may no longer want to do it if I started to practice as a generalist. She became the breadwinner of our family. My salary as a fellow only covered for my own needs. My mom gifted my dentist brother and I a booty room medical clinic in Laguna, where I stayed from 10 to 12 and then 1 to 4 p.m. In the first few months, I made a few thousand more than what our housemaid earned. You can imagine my depression. Here I am, a UP Medicine graduate, trained as a dermatologist from UPPGH, having given up the best of my youth to medicine, only to earn a little better than what my parents gave our longtime family needs. I had no secretary. One time, I was sweeping the floor when a new patient came in to us. Nandiyan na po yung dermatologist? I told her, Opo, tuloy po muna kayo. I kept the broom in the closet, wiped the sweat off my face, turned around and said, Hali po kayo, tingnan ko na po kayo. You should have seen the look on her face. Grace had a chance to consult with Dr. Gato, a PGH ENT graduate for a bout of sore throat. At that time, she was already eight months into her practice. That meeting proved to be a turning point for her. 
He gave her practical tips to jumpstart her career. Stay only two hours a day, two days a week, initially in a clinic. And on days only when the time slot, add on days only when the time slot becomes full. Apply in many hospitals so you can find your niche. Give up the clinic only when you have stayed there consistently for two years. Practice in one geographic area so it's not hard to do daily rounds. Apply in non-stock hospitals for now if you cannot afford to buy stocks. He gave Grace a list of hospitals she could apply in. That day with Dr. Gato was truly a milestone. Not just a turning point in Grace's itching throat, but more so in our lives and the way we would practice medicine. When Dennis graduated from pediatric pulmonology, I was on my third year of private practice. Following Dr. Gato's advice, I affiliated myself with four other hospitals, going four hours a week in each clinic. Life, although challenging, became much more manageable, especially when Dennis came out of training and joined me in real-life practice. In all those years after graduation, we've both been active consultants. The kid we raised while in training, the playing at 2 a.m. kid, Pico, is now in LU4. We're still raising one more, Tippi, who is now 12. Grace is also involved in her advocacy in psoriasis. And I help out in my subspecialty society, the Philippine Academy of Pediatric Pulmonologists. We volunteer a lot in community work, in our Catholic community, doing service work, uh, being part of the teaching ministry, and now as advisors of the youth groups. So, was it easier for us to go through all that we did because both of us were doctors? Well, the answer to that, based on how our lives subsequently played out, is a yes, 80%, and a no, 20% of the time. Many of today's doctors will marry another doctor. The AMA insurance reports of 2014 in their data on the work-life profiles of today's U.S. physicians show that 40% of doctors will marry another doctor or another healthcare professional. This is because 47 to 50% of all med school graduates are now female. This wasn't so a few decades back when the great majority of doctors were male. For me, that's great. I personally think there are more advantages than disadvantages when two doctors marry each other. So let's get down to our list of positives first. <laughs> what are the disadvantages pala of marrying another doctor? And maybe more of you will take the plunge with your white uniform, PGH corridor smelling partner. That smell, by the way, when we got there again, is still the smell from way back 1988 when we plunged into hospital work. Advantage number one. First, you have a spouse that has immense capacity for thinking and for work. What can I say about doctors? If I'm left alone, stranded in an island with just one companion, I would choose a doctor. Preferably one trained in PGH. <laughs> one who could look for a vein to insert a line in with serious determination. Who considers calling a surgeon for a cut down or a pick line as a personal failure. One who can stand the sight of a pail full of self amputated fingers on a New Year's Eve and still manage to assist their owners in the X-ray room while sprouting words of encouragement to the relatives. applicable One who uses plastic cups to fashion as makeshift spacers for inhalers or as a corona, which we used to do, and we shave the scalps of our patients to put the IV line there to protect the IV line. One who can sleep in elevators, standing up and route to the living room because it's the only one she can snatch after 48 hours of duty. One who will try to save a life using whatever resources she has on hand, leaving nothing for herself. In a deserted island, this is the woman I'd want to be with because she would help me find food, shelter, never mind the clothing. I know we will have a lot of intellectual discussions. 
This is the spouse you have married. What an advantage. Her infinite capacity for work is one you can rely on. Whether you're out for a week for a medical convention or staying overnight in the ICU because of a dying patient, you can expect to come back not to chaos but to order in your home and in your career. She can keep the fort defenses up in your absence. If you meet together in the beginning of the day to discuss what needs to be done, you can expect a very short endorsement time. Your spouse is smart, inventive, creative, and a proven workhorse. He can calculate what can and what cannot be accomplished for the day. A problem is attacked from different sides until you can come to an agreement because you both had much practice during case conferences. Though you might have exchanged some words during the process, you would generally feel empowered once your two minds have worked out a solution. If two UP doctors thought about it, then the chance of success in execution is high, very high. Second, this is the most obvious and the most satisfying advantage. Your spouse can more or less understand what they're going through. She will know that at work, the patient's needs must be attended first because she too has accepted that for a doctor, duty and responsibility come before self or relationship, something non-medical people find hard to accept and judge to be cold-hearted. You can be sure if you tell your spouse that you will be home by 12 midnight because you still have to do rounds at the ICU, hindi niya itatanong ng pagalit. May nag-rounds pa ng alas 12 ng kape? Umamin ka na! May babae ka no? Instead, she will commiserate with you and ask if you've had dinner already or would you like to have something to eat when you get home. When you come home from work exhausted, staring far off into space at the dinner table. Your spouse will ask, Toxie? And you can just nod and not say anything. He will more or less figure out that the reason for the silence is that your jaw can hardly move from all the talking you did at the clinic. Explaining and exhorting patients to take their meds or to alter their lifestyle for the best. Once you do talk, he can understand the exasperation of dealing with patients who do not follow instructions and then blame you when they don't get well. He will get all the tips and highs of our brand of work. The stress, the guilt, the sleep deprivation, the grief, the fear, the passion for healing, and the desire to care for others. Another advantage is that your spouse can assist you in your work. I even know of a doctor who covers the practice of his spouse when she's not around. <laughs> Never mind that he's a surgeon and his spouse is a pedia. <laughs> your spouse understands with an insider knowledge even the business requirements of your profession. In our partnership, Grace is in charge of the business side of our practice. She trains our secretaries on how to answer calls, how to talk to patients, She's the one who talks to the accountant, prepares the PIR tax requirements, pays our rents and other bills. She takes care of our supplies, our prescription pads, our calling cards. She answers all our patients' text messages if she can, and refers the text to me only if it needs my expertise. Me? I'm a workhorse. Hardworking, I should say. That's why she allows me to just go in the clinic, see patients, and she handles everything else. We made an agreement early on about our practice. He concentrates on attending to his patients so he can draw in more bacon for our family. My clinic time is more expendable than his since I have to fulfill the business requirements. In turn, he guides me in my career path, ever on the lookout for opportunities to expand my practice since he works in the larger hospitals and is more connected than I am. He had the foresight to insist on my joining the biggest tertiary hospital in our area of practice. I am grateful now beyond words that he did insist. Asian Hospital is a great place for connecting with other dermas, which I missed. Updating my clinical knowledge through the monthly CMEs 
and getting floor referrals from other MDs, which I missed the most when I got out of PGH. It also added considerably to my income, which is, of course, always a great bonus for the practice of our vocation. A fourth advantage is that your spouse can assist you with your patient concerns. You don't have your disposal, an expert that you can refer to instantly. And your patient manifests through the symptom that is right up her alley. For example, my pediatrician my pedia patients come to me for fever and coughing. Occasionally, they might also have a rash. So if I have doubts about that rash tying in with my diagnosis, I will simply call Grace. That's what you call silly preferral. One of the advantages of sharing the same clinic hours with her. Sometimes she even goes on rounds with me. So don't ask me anything about rashes. I've been so spoiled with the presence of Grace, I never bothered to really master the different manifestations. In turn, she calls me once in a while to ask whether the certain infections can be managed on an OPD basis or will require confinement. Your spouse is a wonderful sounding board for your patient concerns. I guess the thing that eats us up the most as doctors is worry about the status of our patients who have a challenging course. It's great that you can talk talk your worries about the case and speak the medical talk without having to filter the language. He understands every medical term you can say to him. You have an instant alter ego, one that asks you questions to see if you've covered all your bases. He reminds you, refer mo na yan, ma. You don't have to do that alone. Or reassures you after he's helped you look at your research to see if you've missed anything. I don't know what else you could have done here. If he's satisfied our, after going through the case with you, then you will feel safe. You will feel validated. You will somehow regain your ability to sleep at night. 